You know, as I was walking, uh, excuse me, not walking to church this morning, as I was <laughs> driving uh, to, to church this morning, uh, some teens, I thought that I was going to pick these guys up this morning. And um, anyway, I went to their house about 1030. I'm not this tall, so my Lord. And as I was on my way uh, there, when I got to their home, they, they actually had overslept, forgot about it. I tried to call them anyway. So I didn't pick up anybody. But uh, on my way back over here, I was noticing something. I, I passed uh, churches. There's churches everywhere. Did you notice that? That's right. uh, just look around. I know a lot of people are oblivious to churches on Sunday morning, obviously. They don't care, don't go. But, but if you're privy to that thing, you can, you can ride along, you can look. And I, I noticed one church um, was there, and then there was another one, and there was another sign for a storefront church, and I started counting them. And uh, the God began to speak to me, and then, then I pulled right into our, right here where we meet, and uh, even right now, you know, another church has just recently opened across from us over there, and, and, uh, and man, now the, the signage, now you got to actually look, if you invite anybody to church here, now tell them, look for the what color sign, you know what color sign? Blue sign, tell them that, because now the signs are popping up, everybody is, is after that, that space, trying to get people, you know, and, and I thought, even where we are right now, there's multiple churches. Yeah. And the thought crossed my mind. I actually asked God this question. Have you ever asked God questions? You ever do that? Yeah. I do all the time, right? And I ask God a question. Lord, why are we where we are? Why do we take the time to have a church? We don't have the, the big money and things like that, like the mega churches I passed, you know, that can have thousands and they do all these things and I, God bless them, they do so much mission work a lot of them and it's awesome. We don't have that. Uh, we're not in a community. i passed so many churches where the buildings have probably been there 50 years or more and you know it's one of those staple things where they always know it's going to be there and the lots were pretty full this morning. About every church the lot was full. That's a blessing if people are going to church, amen, but there they were. And I thought we don't have that either. We're meeting in a high school and you have to follow the what color sign? Blue sign to get here. And it can get confusing. We've even had people go to other churches here to try to come here, you know. I thought, why are we here? Why do we need a church? And to be honest with you, I sat in the van. Some of you wonder, where are you going with this? I'm not getting ready to dissolve this, okay? Don't worry. But I, I was thinking, why? I had to sit in the van a minute and think and pray about it, to be honest with you. And this is what the Lord gave me. He kept bringing it to my mind relationships. That's what it's about. Amen? I think that's why we're here is because we long to belong in relationships. It's what Evelyn was just talking about. Isn't that what the body's for? Amen? You're here because, and I believe that's what we're here for. It's not all these other things, but it's simply relationships and, and, and belonging to a group or a body where we can care for each other, where we can be there when people are hurting, we can be there for people, encourage each other. We can cheer each other on. Now, I still believe with all my heart that God's going to fill this room up. Amen. I believe that. But that's what we have to offer. We can't go out and say, and it's really just, I told you, it's not us. You know what it is? We have to get out of the way, you see. Man, I'm going to tell you. I, I'm going to preach this morning on what abundance means. And it's called redefining abundance. And by the way, I have a while. I just checked the clock. i got an hour and a half. It's only 1030. Praise God. Amen. Uh, we, we operate on different time zones here. You didn't know that? But anyway, I'm just teasing. Uh, some of you are going to slip out when I get ready to pray in a moment, you know. But, but the fact is, is that if you're here, you've been visiting, and maybe today's your first time, or, or, or maybe you've been coming a few Sundays. Maybe you've been here for a while at Center Point. You follow us around in different locations. I want to tell you something. Uh, this is it. Our whole mission is connecting people to God and living our lives so that people can see God through us. That's what it's all about. And that, my friend, is really what people need anyway. Did you know that? That's really what they need. And so, uh, as we go through this, I want you to turn to John chapter 10, if you would, please. John chapter 10. And uh, we're going to start reading here in just a moment. John chapter 10. And I want to read verse 7, if you would, please. Starting verse 7, I'll talk about redefining abundance. Three things quickly that I've been giving you. The first reason that we're doing this series is God has a plan for your life. 
Secondly, there's a battle. Boy, don't we know there's a battle engaged for your life. Number three, too many of God's people are losing the battle. Too many people are losing the battle. And so when we look about, when we look at this thing about redefining abundance, let's look at uh, chapter 10, verse 7. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. If I am the good shepherd, the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Now notice what he says in verse 10. He said, I have come that they might have life, that they might have it more abundantly. I want to talk to you this morning for a few moments. I'll go right there and use it here again in just a moment. A few moments on redefining abundance. Redefining abundance. What does it mean when he says, I have come that you might have life and you might have it more abundantly? Well, you know, people have their idea of what that means. In fact, uh, what does it mean to live a life of abundance? What do people think it means? What well, to the world around us, they define abundance by fortune and by fame. In fact, the church has even gotten in on the act. Listen to the words of one popular website. This is, uh, and I won't tell you where this is, but it says, here, here's what it says on the website for a church. You ready? I'm on word for word. You were made wealthy and rich before you came into existence. You've been predestined to prosper financially. You have every right to live wealthy and possess material riches and clothes, jewelry, houses, fine cars, and money in abundance. Owning corporations is a part of your destiny as a believer. The Bible says that wealth is stored up for the righteous. However, it will remain stored up until you claim it. Therefore, claim it now. You possess the blessing to seize and command wealth and riches to come to you. Like God, you can speak spiritual blessings into existence. The church has even bought into what they think this means. Uh, many times you hear that, that it is about all the things in this world. Bill Maher, which I don't use his name very often, especially from the pulpit because he is an atheist, a, a person that, that does everything he can to, uh, to, to try to, do, to get people to not believe in God. In fact, he has put out a few documentaries. And one of the documentaries, one of the kids that I teach in high school said, I watched this. It's kind of interesting when you watch it. He put it out a few years ago, and as I was watching it, what was interesting is that he's riding along in a van or a vehicle, and he's talking to a camera. And he's in the South, the Bible Belt of the country, and, and uh, what is crazy is that, believe it or not, he was riding through. I mean, it just took me a moment to realize, because he showed this church and this church building, and it took me just a moment to realize he was in Salisbury, North Carolina, where I grew up. And he was making fun of the church sites. That's what he was doing, you know. One of them... In fact, he, he stayed and focused on this side, and not only was this a man that pastored in the area I grew up, but he, he tried to interview this guy. This guy also, Pastor John, had a, a meeting with this guy, and he canceled him at the last minute. The evangelistic meeting, you probably remember who that guy is. And I drove up to the church on a Sunday morning and never called him or anything. This is when Pastor John was in evangelism, and drove all the way over there, and uh, the guy sent his wife out and said, we've changed our mind, we're not having the meeting, it was on Sunday morning. And that's rough on an evangelist. But anyway, so I was like looking at this sign thinking, that's the guy. There he is. But anyway, so Bill Maher was going around and his whole idea was to try to make Christianity look bad. Now let me give you an idea of how he grew up. In this documentary, he tells you his own background if you don't know it. Bill Maher's uh, father was Catholic and his mother was Jewish. And when he grew up, he was forced, he said, to go to synagogue sometimes and to Catholic church other times. He said, it was the most boring experience of my life. So he grew up being bored. He grew up being bored. And because of this, he didn't want anything to do with it later on in his life. In fact, he turned against Christ, turned against God, turned against everything that he'd been brought up to believe in. Now, I tell you all I have to tell you this. He sat down with a pastor that, to be honest with you, makes Christianity look bad. I don't know the name of this pastor. I have no idea because I was watching the documentary. I promise I've never heard of him. But as he sat down with Bill Maher, he said, uh, Bill looked at him and he says, wow, it's a nice suit you got on there, man. And the pastor looked at him and he says, yes, it is. He said, and Bill even said this. He said, I couldn't imagine Jesus walking around with something like that. 
And the pastor looked back at him and says, oh, but you're wrong, you're wrong. The Bible says that Jesus' robe was made of fine linen. That's what he said. My ears perked up and I said, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Are you trying to tell him, uh, uh, Bill Maher, a man that's doing this documentary, that uh, it's okay to live extravagantly and to live all these ways and to claim and name it and claim it and say that Christians are to have all this wealth and all these things because Jesus walked around in fine linen? Is that the only thing you've got? By the way, it's not true. Jesus didn't walk around in fine It doesn't mean that. Jesus today, you know where he would have been if Jesus were walking here today on this earth? He wouldn't be in the churches this morning. He'd be out in the streets trying to get the down and out. That's where he'd be. He went in this, he was a, by the way, Jesus was a street preacher. You know what that is? Some of you never heard of that before. That's somebody who goes out in the streets and shares the gospel. That's what it means. And it may come back to that because I'm seeing more and more where people are reluctant to get in their cars and drive to church. Have you noticed that? And I've been thinking, there's a movement going on. A friend of mine is a part of a little bit in Virginia where they're actually going out in the communities, holding church on Saturday or Sunday afternoon in the local parks and telling people, just come on over here. It doesn't matter. You know, just, just trying to get them under the sound of the gospel of Jesus. We may have to rethink this thing about thinking we can put signs up and people's going to come. I mean, seriously, you know. And Jesus, when you think back about what he did, Jesus was like this. And he came in a bad name. This was a guy, and the whole time, I won't go on and on and on, but he's a guy, and I don't care what kind of suit he has. I mean, that's between him and God. But the fact is, he was making Christianity look like that even the church has bought into this. Sadly, that when Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly, it means fine clothing and riches and big bank accounts and, and, and big cars and all these things and is that what it is? I'm asking you. Is that what you think it is? I mean, that's what some say it is. Is that what Jesus meant in John chapter 10? When he said, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Everything in the world is crying out to us that abundance is found in financial and physical prosperity. And I think God blesses us. How many of you believe that God does bless us? Amen? Amen. But at the same time, I have a hard time marrying those two concepts. And I'm going to tell you why. Because in my mind, I think about the Apostle Paul. He always comes to my mind. I have a hard time imagining that being Paul's message when he stood in the church. In fact, I know it wasn't. Paul was a man that you could barely look on him, at him. He wasn't a good-looking fellow. In fact, uh, church history or you know history books that were written around the time of Bible history at that time tells us he was just a little short guy, had all these infirmities. When he talked, you had to listen very closely because you could, you know, he didn't have this born speaker system like me, you know. He's an humble little guy. And been through the scars of wear and tear of life. Somebody this week told me, and this is, it just gets to me when I think about Paul. Somebody this week told me, one of my neighbors, and I know they meant well. But they don't understand, I don't think. Or maybe they've been believing that's what the Bible means by abundance and all this. They told me, they said, uh, your yard's looking a little rough. I said, I know, i got to get the sprinklers fixed. And thank God the other day, a guy talking about people helping each other, a guy fixed it for me. So they get it fixed. And, and I know you're down in Florida, you got to have water, you know, in your yard. And, and so, but now it's coming back. It looks green and all that. And then, and then they said, you need to go out and buy all these flowers. And it's okay. I'm not saying that that's anything bad. I mean, I think beautiful yards are great, right? It's good testimony sometimes to your neighbors and all that. And, but she, all this. And I said, yeah, I know I need to do that. I, uh, my, your yard looks so beautiful. And, and she says, let me tell you why you need to go out and buy all these bushes and shrubbery and all these uh, flowers and make it the best looking house on the street. She said, let me tell you why. I said, why? She said, because you're a pastor. And she said, a pastor, everybody needs to know a pastor has fine things and looks fine and has the best house. And <laughs> Let me give you the words of Paul. I am a bond servant of Jesus. See, the problem is we've we define abundance according to American prosperity. That's our problem. Pastor John, I tell you, we've opened the places in Peru and used to hold pastor's conferences there. I've been talking to Mike Kennedy. I want to introduce the church to Brother Mike. He's done a great job. But next time he comes in, he's started orphanages in Peru. And 
He wants to get the pastor's conference started back there. It's where we go and we go and we teach. You know, one of the most humbling things I think Pastor John tell you is true that we've probably ever done in our life is to stand on a platform and look out at a tent full of men that have traveled over the Andes Mountains 16 and 18 hours and gone without food and they're just there in their simple little clothing. Some of them don't have shoes. Just to hear us teach the Word of God. Are you kidding me? When I went over there, I honestly felt like I ought to be the one sitting here and you guys teaching me. Yes. You see, what is abundance? When you look at the world, these guys that are up pastoring these churches that want to come in here, and, and, and Brother Mike was telling us he's seen the where they are, and they sit outside under the trees and sit on logs, and when people sit down, they get splinters in their backside, you know, and there's nowhere else to sit, the dirt, and, and, and this is what I'm talking about. That's their church, and those pastors are loving their people up there in the Andes Mountains and, and doing everything they can, and that's what I'm talking about. Yes, sir. You see, when we look at the Bible example of what abundance is, I can't marry the fact of what Americans are pushing down our throat, yes. that the church and what prosperity is supposed to be. I don't believe it. I don't believe that that's what Jesus meant when he said that... that you live your life abundantly is that you can be as rich as you can be and have the biggest house you can have and you pastors you step forward because you're the ones that ought to do it and lead by example how have we gotten so far away from that well the people don't like to hear what I'm saying now I mean people like to go to church and hear that they can be you know hey if you serve God you're going to be wealthy and rich and drive the nicest cars and all of this and look at me I'm the example of all this. Why every time I hold my hand up, the, the bling is so bright it blinds you, you know. I mean, I'm serious. How many are with me this morning, amen? amen? I'm not just like up here complaining. I'm preaching this morning to you, amen? Give me a truth, amen? That's American distortion of what Jesus meant here. That's what it is. 